Welcome back to the Narrative Monopoly podcast. On today's episode, we have the canary in the coal mine for institutions. It has become fashionable for a lot of people to comment on the decay and the crisis within our institutions. Well, the man who actually put that idea to paper a few years ago in his book, A Time to Build, is Yuval Levin. Yuval joins us today to share his ideas on institutions. We obviously touch on that topic, and he also is a wealth of knowledge on a variety of other topics. So this was one of my favorites when it comes to political philosophy and overall, just a really brilliant guy. Hope you enjoy. And so without further ado, let's press play. All right, on today's podcast, we have Yuval Levin. He is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of National Affairs. He was a domestic policy advisor to the 43rd president of these United States. He is the author of numerous books, including the one we're going to dive into today, A Time to Build, from family and community to Congress and the campus, how recommitting our to our institutions can revive the American dream. And perhaps most importantly, he's seemingly always a few years ahead of the curve. How are you, Yuval? I'm doing well. Thank you. I, I, I don't know that I can live up to that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Did I miss anything there? Uh, no, that's that's great. That's my story. Great. Well, I'm happy to to have you on because I do think that, you know, if you read uh, your book and, and, and any of the, the the pieces that you've put out, you know, it, it is apparent that that you are kind of ahead of the curve and, and the leading thinker, one of the leading thinkers um, on the right today. And I think that you take a very nuanced approach. I want to start off, I want to throw it back on you. You know, you, you're, you're very influential uh, in the debate today, as, as we've, we've just noted. Who are the thinkers, dead or alive, that have most influenced you? Well, that's a wonderful question. It's uh, it, dead or alive gives me a lot to work with. Um, you know, in a sense, the the thinker who's influenced me most is probably Edmund Burke. Um, I did my PhD dissertation on Burke a while ago, and uh, have in a way been paraphrasing him in all my other work ever since. Um, and what really speaks to me in Burke is his appreciation for the complexity of social life, his understanding that theory is nice, it's useful, it's clarifying, but reality doesn't actually answer to theory. Theory just tries to explain things that are happening in the world, to put them into some order for us, but it isn't what drives events. And we have to understand that events are driven by really, really complicated human motives and interactions and institutions and societies. And that leads to a kind of humility that to me is at the is at the foundation of conservatism. Humility about what we know, about what we can do, about how well we can anticipate the consequences of what ha- of, of what we set out to do in the world. So that has always been for me a, a set of premises that's been very important. If there's one thinker, it would be Burke. Um, but, you know, of course, there's more than one. And uh, I would say after Burke, I'd put Tocqueville in helping me think about America. Um, the 20th century sociologist Robert Nisbet is hugely important in my thinking about the nature of society. Um, my teacher in graduate school, Leon Cass, is someone who's shaped me in, in a variety of ways. Um, you know, I think in a way... Cass taught me to paraphrase Aristotle, which is, my, you know, my other marketable skill. If there are two things I can do, it's paraphrasing Burke and Aristotle. And in a way, Burke was paraphrasing Aristotle. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that adds up to uh, a, a, a worldview that tries to think about politics and society in a hopeful, conservative way. And those two things don't always work together, but I try to make them work together in my thinking. Let's back up for a minute. Now, you know, in in your position, what is your overarching goal in your day-to-day work? I mean, obviously, you know, you're you're a leading thinker here, but as you, you know, you know, 
I guess we don't go to work every day anymore, really. But, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe if you migrate to the office in your home. Right. I when I go to the basement, what am I trying to do? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I would say a couple of things. Um, the, the work of the policy scholarship that I'm involved with, and, and I'm basically I'm a think tank scholar and I uh, am the editor of a policy magazine. Um, that work is intended to clarify some of the challenges that confront the country and think about how to address them. Basically, I would think about it in three parts. I try to think about the kinds of principles that should guide American public life. I try to think about the sorts of problems that we face now in America, and then about how to apply those principles to address those problems. And frankly, right now, it's the second of those that's hardest to do, to actually understand our problems, to understand contemporary America in its own terms, not in the kind of distorted frames that left and right sometimes have, but to actually think about contemporary problems as they are, is the hardest thing for us in the think tank world. And a lot of what you'd find in National Affairs, the journal that I run, and a lot of what you would find, I hope, in my own work, is trying to peer through those layers of kind of familiar cliches and think about the country's challenges as they really are. And the hope of that kind of work is that it will inform citizens and also policymakers um, as they try to make decisions. Beyond that, I'm also kind of in in management at the American Enterprise Institute. I run a team of people who are thinking about um, constitutional issues, who are thinking about social and cultural questions. And obviously that has its own challenges and its own uh, opportunities. But fundamentally, we all engage in that work. We're trying to help policymakers and citizens make good decisions for the future of the country. Now, you know, and we, we had, uh, you know, one of your colleagues, Adam on earlier and he, we, he, him and I actually kind of went down a, a road speaking about how uh, think tanks often operate as, as publishers almost. And I know that that probably hits home with you because uh, you know, as the publisher of national affairs, how do you think about connecting the dots between the thinking that you're doing? And I, and I want to say, you know, for anyone not familiar with your work, I think the thing that, that I really like about it, almost regardless of the actual uh, details of it, is it, it, it's mostly first principles thinking, right? And you just alluded to that in that, you know, a lot of times people in the debate uh, that, that people tune into, it's really between the 40 yard lines and it is uh, just reacting to kind of the news of the day. But the stuff that really is going to drive uh, the solutions in this country is first principles thinking. And so, I, you know, my question to you would be, how, how do you connect those dots between that thinking all the way into, let's say, you know, a bill on the president's desk? Well, I'd say for me, the work that the think tanks do um, in, a, in a sense, exists at the, at the intersection of what we would think of as academic work and what we would think of as politics. And that intersection is an important place because um, academic work can easily be just irrelevant and abstract. It can be just, and, and I shouldn't say irrelevant, but knowledge for its own sake rather than with a practical purpose. Politics, on the other hand, as you say, can easily just be, can easily just be very shallow. And it can easily miss the significance of underlying principles and premises. My work personally has always been at the intersection of theory and practice in this way. It's tried to think about how the kinds of ideas that people wrestle with in in political philosophy can actually be relevant to the kinds of work that people do in public policy. Um, And so I have something of an academic background and got a PhD at the University of Chicago, but I've also spent now two decades in Washington working on public policy. And I think there are a lot of ways for those two worlds to shed some light on one another, to influence each other. And there's actually not nearly enough um, real bridge building between them, real thinking about how they can interact with each other. I would say that that kind of work and the think tank work in general is especially important now because in the areas where the academy has traditionally been useful to public policy, it's much less useful today than it has been. Those areas, for example, um, you might think about macroeconomics, you might think about foreign policy, 
Um, you might think about the, the sort of core foundations of our domestic debates. These are places where political leaders in the past have sometimes really been influenced by academic work, right? The work that uh, scholars of foreign affairs do really shaped American public policy in the Cold War. Um, today, the academy is much more specialized, much more narrow, and is simply not as interested in being influential in public policy. So that I think, for example, that the basic categories of macroeconomics now are basically useless to policymakers. Um, you know, we've got a kind of GDP economics that was created to deal with the Great Depression and hasn't really been updated. And policymakers now, you know, still use it in thinking about unemployment and inflation and monetary policy. And they need help. They need new concepts, new terms to understand the 21st century economy. And they're not getting them because academic economists are doing microeconomics or are doing really narrowly tailored kind of things, experiments. Um, and this, that sort of work now has to be done in the think tanks, left and right or, not, or nonpartisan entirely. It has to be done in the think tanks. I think the same kind of thing is happening in foreign policy where... You know, it used to be that the Harvard Political Science Department would have debates between two of their professors, Henry Kissinger and, uh, and, and Zbigniew Brzezinski, and those debates would really matter. I mean, they would shape the work of presidents of, of the two parties. That kind of thing doesn't really happen now, and it has to happen in the think tank world. So I think the change in the culture of the academy has really altered how we in the think tank world need to think about what we're doing. And for me in particular... That means trying to operate at that intersection of theory and practice of, of academy and public policy. And I think there's a lot to be done there. I, I don't want to overestimate what can be done there. It's not where the big decisions are made. It's not, you know, politics is still politics. But I think that it does benefit from the sort of work we can do. It gets grounded in principles and it also gets applied in ways that are alert to the nature of contemporary problems. And I think both those things can be useful. I think you hit the nail on the head with speaking about the 20th century approaches that are still being applied. And, and I think that that goes across the board. And, and we'll, I think listeners will realize this when we get to the end of the conversation, we dive into your book uh, and you do have a chapter on uh, the academy and, and higher education. Now, when you talk about, you know, the tools of the 20th, 20th century, when you cut your teeth in the Bush White House, you know, how, how did that was that kind of the, the time that opened your eyes to some of this stuff where uh, it, maybe the things that you are taught in the academy are not necessarily as applicable when, you know, the 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 actual uh, game is on when you're when you're when you're inside the arena? Well, somewhat, you know, I'd worked in politics before um, before graduate school. So I, I, I went to college in Washington, D.C. at American University and then worked on Capitol Hill. Um, for the House Budget Committee and for Newt Gingrich while he was speaker, and then went to graduate school at the University of Chicago. And so I would say that by the time I came to work at the Bush White House, I had a sense that um, there was a, just a, a gaping void between academic political science and actual practical politics and public policy. I do think, though, that it just happened to be the case that I worked at the White House at a time when things were changing. Now, this is more obvious in retrospect, but at a time when the Internet was transforming the way politics works, at a time when uh, I know you've had Martin Gurry on, and I think he really puts his finger on this, when just the sheer volume of information to process was exploding year after year. Um, and it, it, the challenge that presented to policymakers and to politicians and people around them um, was just enormous and was only becoming clear, I would say, in that period. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been in Washington during the time when our politics has been transformed by the internet, by social media. And I think that that has given me something of a vantage point on how the incentives that confront politicians have changed. 
and how they've all become performers on a stage in a way that obviously there's always been a significant performative element to politics in a democracy, but it's very different now. And the, the way in which they always have to be thinking about the narrow audience that's going to be most intensely engaged with them on social media, on, you know, on Twitter, uh, but also on talk radio, on the right, on cable news, um, that's, that's different. And it has changed in the relatively short time that I've been uh, engaged in, in this world myself. And so it's been a fascinating thing to see. And I think we're still getting our arms around it. I mean, even that's saying too much. We're, we're barely getting our arms around it at this point and are starting to think about some vocabulary we're going to need to really understand this new world. Well, I, I think in terms of explaining a new vocabulary, you know, Martin's concept of the center and the border was really eye opening for me. I mean, the fact that, you know, you can place an AOC and, you know, a, a Donald Trump on the same spectrum uh, in that they are outside the system opposed to right left is just such, is such a novel way of, of thinking. You know, he, he points out that actually uh, President Obama was the first border candidate in that, you know, a lot of people don't really remember, but, uh, you know, he, he was launching this insurgency almost unknown, uh, going against the machine of, of Hillary Clinton. Do you think that Joe Biden is, is perhaps the last uh, center president that we have? Well, maybe not the last. I, th I think that there I think that there's always going to be some appeal to this kind of candidate who offers experience and something like, um, you know, a sort of throwback politics. Uh, and, and I would also say there have been outsiders before. I mean, you know, in, in a sense, Jimmy Carter was one. Surely in the 19th century, we had some outsider presidents, uh, Andrew Jackson above all. Um, but I, I think that it is certainly true that tension between insider and outsider is now the defining factor in shaping both party coalitions and that the outsiders are the strong ones. That's different. That's very different. Um, and I, I think that it has been most transformative really of the right um, because conservatives, even when we've been critical of, of elites in our society, which conservatives have been since the beginning of the modern conservative movement, We've been the defenders of the institutions in a sense, and so have seen ourselves as natural insiders. And that has just changed. That's changed in this century in a very dramatic way. I'll give you an example. There's always conspiracism in, in democratic politics. There always is in the politics of a democracy. But there's a kind of conspiracy that the inside party believes, and there's a kind of conspiracy that the outside party believes. I would say the, the, the sort of conspiracy that the inside party goes for sounds something like a foreign government is trying to manipulate our elections, right? That's the sort of thing the right would have said about the Russians in the 20th century. It's the sort of thing the left says about the Russians in the 21st century. The outsider's conspiracy sounds like the elites who run the government and the elites who run the big corporations are conspiring against the people. That's the kind of thing the left would have said in the 20th century. It's the kind of thing the right says in the 21st century. And so you've seen a real transformation of the, the sort of core self-understanding of the American right in the last 20 years that I think is still working itself out. Obviously, the Trump phenomenon was one example of it. I think we're going to see more. It doesn't mean we'll never have a center president again. I think we will. But it does seem to me that the, the tension between inside and out is going to define our politics in a way that we have not seen in a long time. I actually want to fast forward to the end of your book here. Uh, so, you know, to, to give listeners an overview, I mean, the, the, the book, A Time to Build, is, is really about uh, the decline in our institutions. And um, it, this is going to oversimplify it a little bit. But the fact that our institutions are incredibly important in being formative uh, in, in developing uh, people to lead our, our country and lead in these institutions. And now they are becoming performative and they're, they're hijacked by people uh, for their own ends. You know, at the end of the book, you talk about how, first of all, it, it was terrible that the wasps would keep out minorities, women, uh, religious minorities, all that stuff. But there was this 
sense of duty almost in that it, it, it's kind of like something that you would see in a movie. I mean, I, I went to a public high school, but I, I understand deeply kind of this like Mitt Romney went to, uh, I don't know, I, I, I forget the name of the high school, right? But he, he goes to some basically a boarding school. Uh, you know, it's, it's like George H.W. Bush, I think was called like the last wasp president. And I, I think there's a lot of anger towards this type of lifestyle because people see themselves as, as sealed out from it. But if you take a step back, you take away the anger, there's something to in kind of in, imbuing a sense of duty to uh, to, to, to young ch children at a young age that they're, you know, on this planet to serve others, to serve these institutions. That's kind of what I took away from, from that part of the book. Uh, I'm sure that I'm, I'm missing something here, but you know, how important is that to, to get, uh, younger Americans to really understand, you know, their place in society and, and specifically within these institutions? Well, I'd put it this way. I think that that so so that argument is about the nature of the elite we have in our society. Every society has an elite. Some people rise to the top and, you know, there's some unifying thread that holds them together and there's no getting around having an elite. The question is, how do people rise on the basis of what and then what's expected of them when they do? And I would say that because the, the organizing principle of how people rise now is something like meritocracy. We, we invest a lot more in how they rise than in what we then expect of them. You have to pass certain tests. You have to get a good SAT score, get into a good college. And if you do into one of the real elite schools, then you're basically going to be part of what is now a unified American elite. The people who run all our institutions went to one of these 10 schools and there's a sense of, uh, of, of a kind of right to exercise power and authority in people that you talk to coming out of these universities. And that's where our elite comes from. It's more fair than it was when the WASPs ran everything because it's open to all kinds of people provided they can meet these standards. And that is an improvement. I want to be clear that I do think that that is an improvement and an important one. But we don't have then the kinds of expectations of that elite that, that most aristocracies have of the aristocrats, right? So as you say, the wasps were trained to think that they owed society something. Now, we shouldn't overstate that. They, they often abused their power and you know, mistreated people and, and, and used institutions for their own ends, obviously. But there was an ethic of... Uh, elite obligation that they at least had to pretend to comport with. And that pretending has some I I real consequences too, even if you're pretending. There's a sense that people with power are constrained by an obligation. That's actually what institutions do. They constrain powerful people in accordance with some idea of integrity or some ideal or goal so that um, it puts them in the service of the larger society somehow. If you think about some of the institutions that we're supposed to respect and take seriously, think about professional institutions, right? Why do you trust uh, an accountant? You don't just trust an accountant because that's somebody who understands complicated accounting rules, but also because that's a person who th there are certain things an accountant wouldn't do or say. If he puts his name to something, it's because... He attests that this is the truth as he understands it. Um, if you don't believe that, then you don't trust the accountant. And that's true of a lot of our institutions. We trust journalists because they, they live by a certain ethic. Their work is subject to a certain process. And that's the only reason we take them seriously. But if instead our society says to us, trust the people who got into Harvard, whatever they're doing, that's why they're at the top then that society is not really offering us a reason to trust our leaders. And I think we're now in a situation and it becomes worse as more and more of our elite institutions become platforms, places to stand and build your own following and build your own brand rather than institutions that force you to work within them and thereby constrain you. Um, that transformation from, from mold to platform that I describe in the book makes it much harder for us to trust our institutions and to trust our elites. 
And it contributes to this sense that there's an outside and an inside that the inside can't be trusted and that therefore our institutions are just a sham. That That's where our, this populist moment comes from in our politics. That's where a lot of the kind of social crisis that we're living through comes from. The sense of alienation people have that this country isn't for them, it's for somebody else. Um, I think there's a hugely important role for elites to play in changing that. And that role has to do with being constrained and with, with making it clear that people with power have an obligation to use it for the purpose of the larger society. And we're just not good at that now. We're very bad at it. I asked Martin uh, Gary on this podcast, are the elites worse or is it just the fact that we can ne- we, that we now have increased transparency? And he he replied just saying yes. <laughs> so it, you know it, it's both. And, and what really comes to mind is uh, the 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 thought of the difference between you know who served in the Iraq War and who served in World War II. Right? There's an image in World War II. It's not just an image. I mean, uh, it was T- Teddy Roosevelt's grandson getting the Medal of Honor. You know, he's on Omaha Beach. Uh, or there on D-Day. And, uh, you know, that's the grandson of a president. He doesn't necessarily have to be there. Right. And then you have, you know, Joe Kennedy, a very wealthy man, his his first son, who is supposed to be the heir to the Kennedy throne. I mean, he dies in combat um, and he's got other sons in, in, in World War Two. And then fast forward. And uh, Iraq is is mostly a lower middle class, uh, lower class war that's that's being fought. And so, you know, what what that makes me think of is you know, we talk about the elites, talk about the crisis of authority. It's, it's, it's this kind of abdication of leadership, right? I mean, I think that the, the hallmark of leadership is being able to never ask uh, someone to do something that you're not willing to do. I mean, it's, it's the story of uh, the, re, you know, the stories you, you hear about Jim Mattis, you know, what, why is he a good leader? And the story is always, well, you know, his guys that were 19 were out on a out on the front lines and he snuck away at 2 a.m. to to cover their post. Right. It's never uh, he gave this incredible speech. It's, it's, it's those anecdotes. Now, in terms of institutions, let, let's go back. Let, let's define how are these institutions failing? And, and, and I want you to define institution as well, because I do think that, you know, I've read the book. I, I get it. But I think for the audience, yeah. you know, it's good to clarify what are these institutions and then what you've alluded to. And then how are they failing uh, to actually be formative? And, and they've now turned into formative. Yeah, it's very important to define institution. It's also very hard. Uh, you know, the term is so capacious that there are a lot of different ways to define it. There's a huge academic literature on it. The book works through some of that. But I would say for our purpose here, by institutions, I really mean the the durable forms of our common life, right? The shapes, the structures of what people do together. So some institutions are organizations and they have something like a corporate form, a university or a hospital or a, or a school or a civic association. These are institutions, they're, they're technically formalized. Some institutions are, um, they're social forms of a different kind. Maybe they're shaped by laws and norms but without that sort of corporate structure, the family is an institution. It's the first and foremost institution. You can talk about the institution of marriage or a particular tradition or profession as an institution. So what holds them together? That they are durable is one important thing. An institution keeps its shape over time. And so it shapes a kind of realm of human experience. A flash mob is not an institution. But most important, what's distinct about it is that it's a form in the deepest sense of form, it's, it's the shape of the whole, the organization that speaks of a purpose and a logic and a function. So an institution is a social form. It's not just a bunch of people. It's a bunch of people who are ordered together to achieve a purpose, to pursue a goal, to advance an ideal. That purpose, that goal shapes their relations to one another. The institution gives them roles in relation to one another. Um, and ultimately, because it's a form, an institution is also formative. It can't help but be formative. It structures our, in- our interactions with one another. And so it structures us. It shapes our habits, our, our expectations. Ultimately, it shapes our character, really our soul. And that formative role, the way that an institution creates a certain type of person, 
is at the heart of what makes an institution important. And it's why we trust it. We trust an institution that seems like it shapes trustworthy people, right? It forms people who take the, some ideal seriously and really act accordingly. So, you know, you look at the, at the data on why Americans have lost trust in institutions. The thing that really stands out is actually the military, which is the one national institution that people do trust. And I think the reason for that has less to do with the military being very good at its job and more to do with the military being really unabashedly formative. It says we take men and women and we turn them into soldiers and Marines and, and sailors. And that's a better human type. And people, people in this country really believe that that's true. I think it's true. So that when somebody tells you that they went to Harvard, you might think, well, that's a smart person, I guess, that you got into Harvard. If somebody tells you they went to the Naval Academy, you're inclined to think, well, that's a serious person. And not because they got in, but because the Navy makes serious people. Um, that's how an institution should want to be thought of. And when we trust institutions, what we're trusting is that they make serious people. But gradually over time, in the last several decades now, but especially in, in the 21st century, a lot of our institutions have, have abandoned that, that role, that goal of shaping people, and instead have come to be seen as platforms, as a place to be, to be seen, to be elevated, to have a higher profile, a place to stand and yell, right? That's what Congress has become in a lot of ways, just a place to be seen. That's what universities have become. That's what a lot of journalistic institutions have become. They're interchangeable with one another. They're all just places to stand and yell, uh, you know, about culture war questions mostly. And they're also not doing their job, which is to form a specific human type that answers to the purpose of that institution. And so I think that transformation, that change from this institution is going to shape me to this institution is going to display me. Um, it's implicit, right? Nobody actually thinks in these terms exactly. But if you ask yourself, what does somebody who, run for, who runs for Congress now expect to do? It has a lot more to do with getting a better time slot on cable, with getting a bigger social media following and being a bigger part of the culture war theater that our politics has become. And similarly, expectations of what happens at the university, of what corporate America is supposed to do. All these things are just now expected to be places to make a statement. Um, and that's important. It's not nothing, but it's a, it's a de deformed way of thinking about what institutions are for. And it has a lot to do with the kinds of problems our society faces. I think a great example of this is President Trump would would constantly tweet about something that, you know, he took issue with that he had the power to change. That's right. <laughs> yeah. DOJ I mean, you can't is make doing this and that. And, you know, they, this is exactly the insider outsider thing. Right. Everybody in power wants to be an outsider because that's the cool thing to be. So even the president of the United States, the ultimate insider, wanted always to present himself as the outsider, as the person who's being somehow mistreated by the establishment and complaining about it. A lot of members of Congress are like this. They, they don't want to be taking hard votes or negotiating committee. They want to find the camera and talk about how terrible Congress is. And the irony that they are Congress just never seems to influence that desire. All right, let, let's take a trip along this uh, this cul-de-sac here because you wrote a piece for The Atlantic uh, last year, Transparency is Killing Congress, which is a good argument that's in your book as well. But I, I think that you do a great job of laying the argument out in this piece. I'm personally obsessed with distribution. And a lot of this stuff makes me think, you know, these people are just leveraging these established institutions for their distribution, which is uh, really just pronounced in the media. Um, you know, you join the New York Times and all of a sudden, you know, you're writing all these people and, and, and then, you know, you see it in Congress. But let me let me read a quote from this piece in The Atlantic. When an institution becomes too thoroughly transparent, it becomes indistingu indistinguishable from the open public space around it. And so it's simply another arena for public speech rather than a structure for meaningful action. The committee system is where the tell and I'm fast forwarding here. The committee system is where televised transparency has done real damage. 
The floors of the House and the Senate have never really been great venues for deliberation, but committee work frequently did involve real negotiation and bargaining. It is where the legislature's hardest work is done. I could not agree more. I, I, I have in my blood, I believe the take that we need to get the cameras out of Congress. And, and, and I don't I do not buy the counter argument that it's about transparency because that you can just release the transcripts. Why can't why, why is it not good enough to, to read uh, the transcripts? Now, what is uh, your main argument here? Uh, is it to get rid of the cameras in the committees? You know, what, what is the thought process here? Yeah, in that particular piece of the argument, absolutely. I, I, I think that it's always a matter of degree. You do need some transparency in public institutions, certainly. And, you know, I think even allowing cameras on the floor of the House and Senate, it's OK. I mean, it has ruined the, the, the culture of the floor of the House and Senate. It has. What happens there now is just you look at a camera and you're producing a YouTube clip to use in an election ad. Um, that's not great, but it's okay. I mean, look, no one's ever been persuaded of anything on the floor of the House or Senate. So the, not all that much is lost, but committee work is really where Congress functions. And what, what Congress does, the purpose of the institution is negotiation. The institution exists to enable accommodation among competing factions in our society. It's the only institution that serves that role. So that if it isn't serving that role, then that just doesn't happen. And we end up with a broken polarized politics. And th that happens in committee work. So that n negotiation is basically impossible to do in public. If you're watching people bargain in public, you're just watching a show. That isn't really what they're doing. <clears throat> and that means that when you put cameras in a committee room, I mean, I've spent a lot of time more than anybody should have to watching congressional committees. I used to work for the House Budget Committee and you just as a policy scholar, you spend a lot of time doing this. What happens now, if you go and watch a committee hearing, is not members talking to each other. It's not members listening to the witnesses they've asked to come in. It's members talking to a camera. You'll see some, some witnesses there and then nine Republicans will say exactly the same thing as one another. And then nine Democrats will say exactly the same thing. And you're sitting there thinking, why are they doing this? Didn't he hear that the, the other guy just did that? It's because he needs a video of himself saying that. And that's all that the committee is providing is a venue for producing YouTube clips and for saying something that's going to be in just the right tenor to get on cable news that night. And that's fine. Members want to be on TV. They should have places to do it, but they've got lots of places to do it. What there's no place to do anymore is the actual work of the Congress, which is bargaining toward legislative accommodations. And so I absolutely think it's essential that there be some spaces where members can negotiate with one another. If you think about it, the only place where that can happen now are the leadership offices at midnight before the government shuts down. And that's why all the work of Congress is done in those spaces. That's the only place where legislation really gets written. If you create more spaces that can be in inside Congress rather than on top of Congress, you'll have a lot more legislative work getting done. And I do think that pulling cameras out of committees or at least having committees create another kind of hearing, call it a work session where there aren't cameras, they'll get a lot done that way that now is simply impossible um, under the lights. And I would also say, I think you're exactly right to think in terms of distribution. And a lot of people in all of these institutions what they're doing is exactly leveraging the, the cachet of the institution to create a distribution system for themselves. And increasingly, it's also working in the other direction so that, you know, n n major newspapers now become basically aggregators of interesting Twitter personalities rather than actually forming the work of a, a cadre of professionals. And it undermines the institution. It's not useless. I mean, you know, they are genuinely interesting Twitter personalities. But what isn't getting done is the work of a newspaper, and that's important work. As far as the congressional hearings, I mean, there's two, two recent examples that stand out in my mind that I think a lot of people will know just from watching the news. I mean, the, the first example would be Katie Porter 
And every time there's a big banker in there, she's got the whiteboard and the whiteboard. I mean, it's, it's really an ingenious trick when you're, when you're talking about the distribution, because people will remember the one thing that that's different. Right. And she's, you know, she beats him over the head. This is the villain. I'm the good guy. And then Ted Cruz, when Jack Dorsey comes on with absolute certainty, with absolute certainty, he's going to say all of the things that you expect him to say. He's going to yell at him. He's going to, you know, ask him the binary questions and then he's going to push it out and, and raise money from it. Yeah, ironically, on Twitter, right? He'll, he, yeah. he'll, what he's doing <laughs> is creating a video he can use on Twitter to show how, you know, to, to make the kind of case he needs to make to his narrow constituency of voters that most matter to him. That's what they're all doing in these hearings. I, and I think the irony would be in that situation is that Ted Cruz is obviously a, a brilliant legal mind. And if he were to sit down with Jack Dorsey without the cameras, I bet that they could actually hash out a solution to uh, the, the speech issues on, on Twitter, which are a real issue. Yeah, that, that's the great irony. Now, let me give you a, 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 an observation here and then uh, to set up my question of how, how you would solve this. So you go back maybe 10 years and the quote unquote rabble rouser of Congress would be someone like Thaddeus McCotter. So Thaddeus McCotter, people that, that don't know, uh, quirky figure, dry sense of humor, but you know he, he would say some things, he's, he plays guitar, uh, but he knew what he was talking about. I mean, he truly knew what he was talking about in terms of policy and philosophy. Fast forward, and we have someone like Matt Gates, who is the incarnation of the person that would fill that that role of being kind of the the rabble rouser. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And there's there's more of these these congressmen like that. So my question to you is it does not seem like this is going to get any better because the incentives keep continue to move that way. So outside of just removing the cameras, what other reforms could we take to perhaps uh, not eliminate the rabble rousers, but to have people who truly know what they're talking about and go back to being formed uh, into the role of a, a representative in our representative government. Yeah, I think thinking in terms of incentives is exactly right. Um, it, 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 in some ways, of course, there have always been members of the House who don't know what they're talking about, but they haven't been the members who, who, who are known to everyone, right? They're not the most prominent members of the House. Um, now they are because what they're good at is getting attention. And that's basically getting attention in the broader media and political cultural ecosystem is the way to advance yourself within Congress as well. So that there's just not much of an incentive. You have to really be motivated to push against your incentives if you want to be a policy minded member. Uh, what's needed, therefore, is a change in the incentives. Now, the biggest challenge is not thinking of what these changes could look like. And I'll suggest a few. The biggest challenge is how are you going to get members to want to make these changes? Because they need to want to change things in order for that to happen. I think the kinds of changes you'd need look like making actual legislative work more of a path to prominence and status. That means first of all, giving members more to do. One of the strange cultural challenges in Congress now, and it's hard to see from the outside, is that most members just don't have anything to do most of the time because there's not a lot of legislation happening. What, their committee work is not that relevant, even to their constituents. Um, and so th they vote on these big bills that other people write. And the rest of the time, it's hard to blame them for just raising money and trying to get on television because that's what there is to do. And these are ambitious people. They're going to do something. Um, I think that changes to the budget process that allow members to legislate more and to do it all the time. So to break up the consolidated budget process that was created in the 1970s into smaller pieces that happen all the time, I would eliminate the distinction between authorization and appropriation in Congress, which doesn't really make sense anymore, um, and have Congress function more like some of the state legislatures where authorizing bills can also spend money. That would mean that what you do in committee is actually what Congress does, spend a lot of public money on various priorities. Um, and it, it would make that work a lot more attractive to a lot more members. 
you also have to think about the, the role of the committees. I would, for example, I would give committees control of some floor time in both houses so that the work they do could actually get voted on. Whereas right now, you can only ever get a vote on something that your party leader wants on the floor. Um, and so if you just don't happen to be exactly where the party leader is, then tough luck. You're going to spend a lot of time wasting uh, your energy. I think these kinds of changes can make a big difference, but none of them can happen unless a majority of the members of the, of the, the relevant House of Congress want them to happen. And so I think that change has to begin by working with the fact that members are not happy. Members of Congress are not satisfied with their quality of life at this point, with what they have to do to stay in office. Very often when a member leaves office, even if, if they've lost an election, you talk to them, there's just this sense of relief. And it's such a bad sign that that's how they feel. But that means that they want to change things. And so I think some of these kinds of changes that would improve their quality of life some change the schedule some. So the Congress is in session for several months at a time and members aren't going back home every weekend, but are actually working for a while and then are at home for a long while. Um, these kinds of things that seem like they're minutia, like they're wonky, they can make a big difference in how the institution actually functions and in what it means to be prominent and be appreciated within the institution. But a lot of it is about constraining transparency so that members don't always feel like they're on a TV show and their incentives don't look like the incentives that confront entertainers, but rather more like incentives that confront politicians and legislators. The other book beyond Martin Gurry's Revolt of the Public that has really shaped my thinking on distribution is amusing ourselves to death. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you brought that up, you know, in terms of incentives and all the things that you're talking about that are small, but may have way larger ripple effects down the line through this podcast, I've really reoriented my thinking to systems thinking in that, you know, you can't really change uh, or twist one dial here or one dial there. It's really, you have to think about the way that the machine is built um, and that each dial is not necessarily the most important. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that you worked for Speaker Gingrich. How much of, of, of what you just mentioned is a product of the changes that Speaker Gingrich made when he basically vacuumed power from the committees to the leadership? Yeah, well, a, a lot, but I think that that has to be understood in the context of a, of a longer term transformation that Gingrich was very much a part of. It began really in the early 1970s when a large class of freshman Democrats were elected in the wake of Watergate. They were liberal Democrats, progressives, we would now say, and they came in and realized that everything they want to do is being held up by party, by rather committee chairmen from their own party, Southern Democrats who ran all the important committees. And their solution to this was, let's disempower the committees and instead empower the party leadership so that it can speak for basically the consensus of the party, which was well to the left of these Southern Democratic chairmen. And so there began a process of centralization of power, especially in the House, where the Speaker got to control the schedule, to control the Rules Committee. All these things that just matter enormously. And gradually, you began to see a, a move from committee-centered legislation, which was very heavy on negotiation, on bargaining, but also on, uh, on corruption and on all kinds of waste and, uh, and, and abuse of power, um, and toward a more centralized party apparatus where the legislative process answered to the, the communication side of the party. The vision the party was putting before the public and what it was doing in Congress came to be more connected to one another. Um, I, I would look at the Gingrich reforms in the 90s as an extension of that logic. Gingrich was doing what those House Democrats were doing. And for similar reasons, he came in, you know, Republicans hadn't been in the majority for a, an entire generation. And Gingrich came in and realized the House is really hard to move. He had promised to make a lot of changes and it just wasn't easy to do. And the way to make it happen would have to require centralizing more power in the hands of the speaker. The House Republicans felt like they owed their majority to Gingrich. I think they did. 
And so they gave him that power. And he centralized even further than those House Democrats had done. And we've actually since seen even more of that kind of centralization because members came to realize that when the power rests not with them, but with the speaker, they get a lot of protection. They don't have to take votes they don't want to take. They don't have to take votes they're going to answer for at election time. They only vote on what they want and only in the way they want to if they're in the majority. And if they're in the minority, they just vote no on everything. And that's easy, too. And so that centralization has really transformed the culture of the Congress. And it's happened in the Senate since then, too. Mitch McConnell is really a master at protecting his members. They never have to take an uncomfortable vote. And the Democrats learn this lesson. And so that's how Congress works now. I think that centralization has been very bad for the system. Um, and so part of what I, I argue for, as I suggested before, is giving the committees more power again, allowing factions to express themselves within the two parties. The parties are very cohesive now, and that's not a good thing because it makes negotiation very difficult. And so I think it's important to think about even electoral changes, things like ranked choice voting that conservatives tend to shy away from, I think would actually do a huge amount of good for the right and for the left um, and would allow Congress to represent more of the fine grained diversity of the country in a way that would encourage more bargaining, more negotiation, more legislating. I'm all for trying uh, new ideas. I mean, I've mentioned on this uh, podcast before that I'm, I'm, I'm for repealing the 17th Amendment. Uh, I, I don't think that it has been that one, yeah. <laughs> What's interesting about what you just said around complexity is that ties back into your love of Burke in that the humility to understand that human affairs are very complex and that we cannot control them, even in an institution as small as one as Congress and specifically, you know, the House of Representatives, 435 people, and you still can't control the human affairs there. Now, let's let's get into, you know, the solutions, because your book is titled A Time to Build. So that infers that there's there's some building to do within these institutions. So my question to you is where do you draw the line between reforming the institutions to become less performative and more formative again, and then building new ones? Because, you know, you're not going to rebuild the family, but you might be able to rebuild journalism. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. It's important to see that a recovery of the right kind of institutionalism isn't just a matter of of getting broken institutions working again. It's also very much a matter of building institutional forms to handle 21st century problems. Now, not everything can be replaced that way. We complain about Congress, we can't just start a new one, at least not very easily. And so there are some institutions like that. I think the families like that, although individual families aren't necessarily, that we can't just conceive of an entirely new alternative for it. But there are a lot of institutions in our society that do just need competitors or alternatives or to be abandoned in favor of a better way. I think that, for example, if you think about higher education, this should be a time for starting new universities. Uh, And it hasn't been. The last time we had this kind of crisis of confidence in higher ed, I would say, was in the late 19th century when it did result in a lot of new institutions arising to compete with the Ivy Leagues. Um, You know, we think they've always been here, but Stanford and Duke and the University of Chicago uh, and Johns Hopkins, these are late 19th century innovations that were created by oftentimes just wealthy donors who didn't like what their kids were being taught at Harvard. We're in that kind of moment again. Now, it'd be very expensive to start a new research university, but not impossibly so. And we should be thinking about alternative models um, for those kinds of institutions. I think we're certainly in that situation in journalism, too. I hope that some traditional journalistic institutions survive, but many won't. And the work they do needs to be done in ways that take account of 21st century realities and technologies and social change and especially economic changes so that the traditional economic model of American journalism, 20th century American journalism, is never coming back. And I think that means you need new institutions that take account of new situations. So I would say the, the, the difference between rebuilding and building a new um, is situational, right? There are some circumstances where the only thing we really can do is reinvest ourselves in making an important institution work. 
there are other places where, you know, a, a groups of people need to exit and try something else. Um, and I think we can see in our lives which, which institutions fit into which category. And we also have to make choices for ourselves about what matters most to us. Which institutions are we most invested in? Where are we going to put our energy and try to think in those places about how do you create the right incentives? How do you create the right internal culture for an institution to serve its proper purpose? It is true that people do not think in terms of building institutions anymore. Uh, when you talk about the university, that that was something that, you know, a hundred years ago, as you, as you said, you know, Stanford, that was something that, that you could do. Um, I think there's other external factors that probably go into that in the structure of it. I mean, land is, is cheaper, obviously there's less yeah. uh, competition. But you look at something like Lambda school where uh, you know, you're having graduates be able to get jobs uh, in software development after 10 months of programming versus four years, and they're not going into debt. It's an income share agreement. So that's a brand new model. And maybe that's, you know, that maybe that opens the door to new research uh, opportunities and the way that that's funded. Now, I think the one question that you ask in the book, or you, you don't ask it, but you, you point out that people should be always asking this question. And it, it's perhaps the marker of a well-functioning institution. And that is, how should I behave? W what do you mean by that? Yeah, I would say in a way, the, the unasked question of this moment in American life is, given my role here, how should I behave? So not just what do I want, not just how do I want to be seen, but as president of the United States or as a member of Congress or as a teacher or a scientist or a lawyer or a pastor or uh, a worker or just a, a parent, a neighbor, given that, what should I do here? I think that the, the people who we most respect in American life now are people who seem to ask that question just automatically before they make important decisions. And the people who most drive us crazy, the people where we just wonder, how could he have done that? These are people who plainly fail to ask that question when they should. It's a question that takes account of obligations and responsibilities, along with taking account of opportunities. Um, and it's, it's challenging. It's, it's difficult to ask that question. You want to be free. You want to just decide for yourself in a given situation. But we have to force ourselves to see that whoever we are, wherever we are in American life, other people depend on us and there are obligations we have. And before we make a choice, we have to think, what role do I have here? What, what am I, what do I need to uphold before I can decide what I need to do? And that kind of question, which places constraints on us is also the way to build trust, to, to, to make yourself more of a trustworthy person by being the kind of person who clearly takes seriously the trust that other people put in you. That's what it takes to be a leader. But I think it's also what it takes to be a citizen what it takes to be just a serious adult in a free society. And this is a time when we have to remind ourselves of that because it doesn't come naturally enough. People are really waking up to the fact that there is a crisis with our institutions. And I do think that the book that you wrote is probably the best resource uh, to, to learn about what that means in practice. R random question for you here. Have you ever met Mark Andreessen? I have not. Okay. Because when I saw the, the, his essay, I was like, Oh, you know, that's, that's similar I, to the book. I, I, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I absolutely. I mean, not only that he chose such a similar title, but I, I think the questions he's taking up are very much the kinds of questions that I try to think about. And that essay is well worthwhile. It's not the same argument I would make, but it's, it, it was a very smart and important essay. I, I do. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I do think that, you know, what you just said around building new institutions, I think it's almost, you know, it, it's a, it's an additive to that argument. And he looks at it from, uh, you know, the point of view of someone who's actually deploying capital to, to make those new things happen. Let me, uh, let, let me get one more uh, question here to, to go back to the, 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 the beginning of this, who are the thinkers on the left that you may not agree with, but you really respect? Well, I think there are probably a couple of categories there. Um, there are some, there are some traditional liberals, people who take liberalism seriously on the left. They tend to be older now, um, and you know that's not a great sign for the future of the left. But um, 
you know, you, you, there are um, there are a couple of such people, for example, the Brookings Institution, our, our, our neighbor in Washington, um, people like Richard Reeves or Bill Galston. Um, and those are just liberals. They're centrist Democrats. They're not very popular within the coalition now, but they're people who are, I think are serious and mean what they say. And even when I disagree with them, which happens often, um, I learn from the way they think. I think there are also interesting people working further to the left of them who are trying to rethink some some economic and social premises. Um, people like like Mike Consell at the Roosevelt Institute, who's younger, um, who I disagree with even more um, because he, I, I think, discounts the importance of markets for American prosperity in a way that's ultimately uh, m missing a, the key ingredient to a successful American economy, but he thinks creatively about the problems that market economies create, and we need that. We do need to understand those challenges. So, I, you know, I think there's some important work being done. You can find it in um, in the Journal of Democracy. You can find it in some of the work of the Roosevelt Institute and some of the work of the think tanks on the left. Um, I wouldn't say that this is a great time for intellectual energy on the left. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of finishing an old to do list. There's a lot of putting for all at the end of great society programs, which are 70 years old. Um, but I do think that there are some people who are trying to confront contemporary problems, too. We have the same challenge on the right. I mean, I, I think we also have a, a, a long standing to do list when what we need to do is think about what's challenging 21st century America, not in terms of how to get back to late 1950s America, which the left is doing too. They, they want to do it economically. We want to do it culturally. We have to think about how to move forward from where we are to advance the kind of ideals that matter to us. And you know that's always the challenge for everybody in American politics. When you talk about intellectual honesty, I think that that's a great place for us to, to close this conversation in asking you as someone who has been known as, uh, you know, one of the first reformicons, as they say, you know, what, what are you making of this uh, intra conservative movement discussion around, um, you know, as you just alluded to the efficacy of markets and the, you know, desire for some on the right to embrace uh, a more planned economy in, in, in the framing that they have around that in terms of families or culture, as you just said. Um, what are you making of, of sort of the embers that are, are burning right now? Well, I think that there there was a tendency for some time on the right for, I guess, coalitional reasons to downplay the downsides of the market economy. And we now find people on the right, many of them are friends of mine, who instead want to downplay the upsides of the market economy. I think we should try to see both. We should try to see that there's not a better economic system than the market economy if you want a prosperous society that gives people opportunities. Um, there's, there, there just isn't a better alternative. And markets really are enormously important for sustaining the competitiveness and the prosperity of our society, but also for doing that in a way that makes room for democracy and for opportunity and for upward mobility. I'm a big fan of markets. We also have to see that markets can have dangerous social consequences, that, they, that if the logic of markets becomes the logic of everything, that tends to undermine family, it tends to undermine community, it tends to undermine tradition, and these are awfully important things. So that our society has to live in some balance between the need for prosperity and the need for solidarity and for a virtuous life and for human flourishing. That, that tension is not a failure. That tension is a success. The fact that we can live with that tension and try to get some of the best of each is what makes our society so extraordinary and what makes modern uh, market economies, democratic market economies so extraordinary. I think we have to work to sustain that balance so that when we lean too far in one direction, we push back in the other. But we shouldn't forget why we believe in markets, why we're skeptical, well, why I'm skeptical of planning as a way forward uh, toward economic prosperity. I think there's just a limit on what planning can achieve. It's a limit grounded in humility 
about the capacity of reason to ultimately organize a complicated society. Our society uh, is so complex that it can only organize itself from the bottom up. And that means that the, the economic system that will suit it best is going to be a market economy. But you know, man does not live by bread alone and not everything is economics. And so there are some issues where we have to say, these are higher priorities than even prosperity. And so we have to care about, we have to care about morality. We have to care about solidarity. We have to care about the kind of culture that our children are growing up in. And it's just a fact that we have to do both these things at the same time. That's, you know, th that's what it is to be a free society. So I think there's some, there are some constructive things about these internal debates on the right now. Um, there are some counterproductive things, mostly about forgetting that this has always been what the right has been about. We've always had these arguments. We've never actually been simple-minded libertarians. That's not true. Um, and so, you know, I think if we saw that, we could learn more from our own experience. But, you know, at the end of the day, these debates are what the right actually is. I think that's a good place to end it. And I think that, uh, you know, we'll have a lot to talk about next time if, uh, if you come back on the, the podcast. So thank you, Yuval. Thank you very much. And there you have it. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a written five-star review. It has to be written. That will be the thing that helps us grow the podcast the most. And if you are just tuning in for the first time, please hit the subscribe button. We have a lot of great episodes coming up, booked all the way through June. Already have recorded most of those. And it is going to be a great summer for the podcast. So again, please, five-star review. Hit subscribe. Uh, really appreciate the support. And we'll see you next week.